Currently, so I won't be, but I, I do want to just take a couple of seconds and play a little bit of a get to know you game. So if this side could just turn so that they can see the other side, if this side could just turn a little bit so that you can see this side. Um, I would just like you to raise your hand if you are representing a district or organization north of I-80 and south of I-80. Okay. Anybody willing to go south of 72? Oh, <laughs> bless your heart. You, now you need to explain to them what south of 72 is. <laughs> it's, a, it's an interstate that runs east-west and the south goes through Springfield and Champaign. All right. Um, raise your hand if you represent a district with more than 5,000 students. More than 1,000, but less than 5,000? Okay, districts between 500 and 1,000 students? Less than 500. All right. Thank you for, thank you for playing our little game. Um, raise your hand if in your district you support two languages. Awesome. Anybody for? Anybody go up to seven? Somebody who's above seven, how many languages do you support in your district? Awesome. I'm guessing you're from Rock Island? Very nice. All right. Anybody else want to wanna throw out their number? Yeah? Oh my gosh, where are you from? Alabama. Very nice. Yeah? 75. Where are you from? Huey. Very nice. All right. Well, thank you for, you know, just letting me get to know you a little. I appreciate that very much. We got about one more minute. Well, it is 2.45, um, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Hello and welcome. My name is Ray Clements. I am the Director of Accountability, and I am very excited to be able to introduce you today to the English Learner Progress to Proficiency Indicator. Um, get to know you here. What I want to know is how would you rate your own knowledge of this particular indicator? Hold up one finger for an expert, two if you are knowledgeable, three somewhere in the middle, four pretty limited, five this is the first time you're ever hearing about it. Okay, thank you. Appreciate that very much. All right. Just uh, yes or no, raise your hand. Yes, if you do know where to access your summative designation reports. If you don't, don't worry, we will be covering that. All right, I am going to start pretty basic here and just talk about what an annual summative designation is. It is a multiple measures index of both academic and student success indicators. It is given annually, except in years where there are federal waivers of assessment and accountability, <laughs> designed to identify schools for support by placing them into school improvement status. Um, and that is including schools that have student groups needing support in otherwise reasonably well-performing schools. I think it's important to note that a school that enters school improvement status stays in status for four years regardless of changes to its annual summative designation. That is an intentional policy choice intended to ensure that districts have four years of guaranteed funding that they can plan and build some sustainability with. There are four summative designations, exemplary, commendable, targeted support, and comprehensive support. Um, exemplary is those that are in the top 10% of the state. They have no underperforming student groups. Um, commendable is everybody not in the 10%, uh, top 10, that also has no underperforming student groups. 
Targeted support is for those schools that are otherwise reasonably well performing but do have a student group whose performance is on par with those in comprehensive support, lowest performing 5% of schools in the state. So indicators and weights, ELP2P is the one we're focusing on today, but it is certainly not the only one. Um, it is one of the federally required. ELA and math growth at the elementary and middle level take up 50%. ELA and math proficiency take up 15% in total, 7.5% each. Science and ELP2P, or okay, English learner progress to proficiency, English learner progress to proficiency, ELP2P. I say it about a million times, it's a big mouthful, ELP2P. ELP2P is 5%, it is one of the uh, federally required academic measures. Chronic absenteeism, 20% at the elementary level and climate survey participation, 5%. Over on the high school side, your composite four, five, and six year graduation rate is that 50%, uh, but the rest looks pretty familiar. ELA and math account for 15%, seven and a half each. Science and ELP2P, both 5%. Uh, their chronic absenteeism is 10% because they also have ninth grade on track at eight and a third and climate survey at six and two thirds. Okay, who is included in the calculation? Students who have been at your school, and it is by home school, for at least half the school year. What counts as half the school year? It's 134 calendar days, as in start of the enrollment to the end of the enrollment. That's not an academic day, it's not an attendance day, it's a calendar day. Monday through Sunday, holidays, weekends, etc. Why 134 calendar days? Well, we literally took the length of every district calendar in the state, added it up, averaged it, divided it in half. That's how we got 134. Groups have to have at least 24, or pardon me, at least 20 students per indicator. Um, so not just 20 kids in the building, but specifically 20 students worth of data in at least five out of the eight scored indicators, one of which has to be one of those yellow indicators, the school quality and student success ones. Um, this does mean that high schools often have fewer student groups because they have lots of single grade indicators, right? Ninth grade on track, single grade. ELA and math proficiency, single grade, grade 11. Grad rate, single grade, okay? So they, they tend to have uh, fewer student groups, not because they serve fewer student groups, just because the way the math works. Yeah? Is, is this audience participation part of the show, or is that later? Uh, we, if you have a question, by all means, pop up to the uh, mic and, and ask it. I don't, I don't know if I need the mic, but if I need it, let me know. It's because they're recording. Oh, because you're recording? Yep. If you okay, so then I'll go really loud. <laughs> Yes. Does the home school, even though they are not the serving school, is responsible for students within that demographic group? Correct. So we, program directors, would need to know the home school and not the serving school for all of those kids. Correct. Thank you. Yep. And, and just to elaborate on the why of that, I mean, it comes down to the fact that um, different districts make different choices on whether or not they spread their populations, concentrate their populations. Uh, at the end of the day, though, the home school is the entity responsible for providing that free, appropriate public education. So that's why, for purposes of accountability, we go back to that home school. So as a quick extension on that, I promise I'll stop. If in that calculation, let's say in the serving school, there are 30 with it that would populate a demographic group, but when you calculate the home school they come from, it gives you 18 and 12, that would not be a statistical demographic group for that is correct. Okay. Yep. Okay, so just so everybody heard that, he was asking if 30 kids are concentrated in one building as the serving school, but then they are split out to two home schools, 18 and 12, would that be a, a student group for purposes of accountability? No, it would not. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. These are great questions. Um, each student has one and only one accountable school. It, it, so even if a kid is in multiple schools throughout the year, they are assigned to their home school of longest enrollment as long as that enrollment is greater than or equal to 134 calendar days with the exception of graduation rate where it's the last home school uh, that touches them. Those enrollments can be non-consecutive as long as the total meets or exceeds the 134 calendar days. Um, just as a note, 
This does differ from the report card assignment rules, not drastically, not substantially, but just in little tiny ways that make it so that your report card number is not necessarily going to equal your summative designation number, okay? So if, if you're looking at the two sources of data um, and you see some differences, don't be surprised, unless they're really big, and then ask questions. All right, it's a four-step process. We start by collecting and calculating performance data. This is the data as you guys know it. This is your access data. This is your grade data. This is your attendance data. This is your IAR and SAT data. We take that for each indicator and we then score that performance and that becomes the indicator score. And ELP to P is an indicator. So we're gonna be talking about the ELP to P indicator score. We take that score, we multiply it by the weight that that indicator has in the system, right? Which for ELP to P is 5%. And then we add them all together and that gets the final index score. And it's that index score that we use to rank order schools, high schools in one list, uh, elementary, middle in the other. Uh, we figure out where that top 10% is, we figure out where that bottom 5% is, and we look at the index score of the school that's just right below that, that bottom 5% line, and that becomes the index score that we use to see if there is a student group anywhere in any school, anywhere throughout the state, that their index score is at or below that threshold one. So that's, that's where we get those, those targeted student groups. I'm gonna move through this pretty quick. I mean, it's the purpose is just kind of sh to show you that we take performance data. This is the way you're used to seeing it. It gets converted to a score between 100 and zero. You know, we then multiply those scores by the weight. We add them up. That gets us an index score. We put them in lists. And then we compare, right? So that, I mean, that's the process. That's, that's what it looks like start to finish. I wish it only took a minute and a half to get through. So a couple of questions that come up all the time. Are the lines for the top 10% and the lowest 5% set at the same time? Yes. Um, only after we draw those lines do we figure out where the, the targeted student groups are. If a school in the top 10% has a targeted student group, do they become commendable or targeted? Targeted. Yep, we, you have a targeted student group, you are targeted. Um, and it, so it overwrites anything. Um, will I get a new summative designation every year? Well, normally the answer was just yes. There was no asterisk there, but uh, thanks to the last few years of waivers, I had to put an asterisk there. And when will my school exit school improvement status? If, if you are a school that is in school improvement status, um, the first year that anyone is eligible to exit will be 2023. So the work that you're doing this year is the work that will define whether or not you exit status, right? So this is the year. All right, let's dive into English learner progress to proficiency unless there are any questions right now. And again, please and thank you if you would hit the mic if you have a question. All right, don't be afraid. English learner progress to proficiency, as I said in the introductory, is, is the only indicator that we score at the student level because their progress is so unique to their own circumstances. It begins on where and when they are first identified, right? So we wanna know both the first year in which they are identified, but also the first grade. Now, I know a lot of you deal with pre-K programs or kindergarten programs. We talked about the fact that there's a new access kindergarten screener, but kindergarten is not a compulsory grade of attendance in the state of Illinois. That was news to me, by the way, and I, went to school here in the state of Illinois. But um, it, because of that, we say for purposes of accountability, the first year in which you can functionally be an EL is first grade. So that's, if a kid is identified in kindergarten, that's fine, good, but first grade is when we pick them up for purposes of accountability, okay? And, and so for a lot of kids, right, if, if we are expecting them to reach proficiency in five years, we want them to have the full five years to grow. So that little chart down there kind of shows you. You wanna go from grade one to two, two to three, three to four, four to five. So we would expect them to reach proficiency on the access test that they take in grade six, right? Gives them full five years to grow. Now, 
Remember, uh, we are giving every student who was an EL in 2021 an additional year to their timeline. So if a student was newly identified in 2021, their years to grow would be six. So that's what the two numbers kind of above the grades look like. What we're doing is for each student then, we are looking at where do they start and where do they need to be to be proficient. So if I'm a student and I start at a 250 and I need to be proficient in seventh grade, right, because I have my extra year, that target is 400. So I need to travel the distance from 250 to 400, or pardon me, 250, yeah, 250 to 400. Um, so I have to go 150 points, right? 150 scale score points. You guys I know work in performance levels, but again, we use scale score because it, it captures really even minute amounts of progress. Um, and so what we do is we take that distance that a student needs to travel, that 150 scale score points, and we would divide it by six. And that would become a student's timeline target. Like I said, it's a, it's a linear progression. It's just if a student made this amount each year in, in five, six years, they would, they would be proficient. Of course, we know that students don't actually grow that way, so we also calculate a revised target every year. So again, if my student started at 250, right, and um, then the very next year, they jump all the way up to 350, right? They have a fabulous first year. They're in a really wonderful program. They make 100 points of gain. Well, the distance they have left to travel just got a lot smaller, right? But they still have five years to travel in it. So their target, their revised target, would get a lot smaller. Um, and we'll look at some, some actual practical examples of this. Um, but that's the idea. On the other hand, if a student who started at 250 really didn't make much progress at all, really just kind of went to a 255, right? The distance that they have to travel really didn't change very much, but now they have a, a year less to do it in. So their target got bigger. The math is basically their gain, their scale score gain from year to year, divided by whichever of those two targets is smaller, the timeline or the revised. Again, why do we use the smaller? We want teachers to look at a set of targets and say, okay, but that's actually achievable, right? I get it, he's now, you know, 300 scale score points behind. Am I gonna be able to get him 300 points in a single year? Probably not. But can I get him the, the 25 or so that he needed to travel initially? Yeah, that's probably achievable. And it's progress and it's worth shooting for. So, as I mentioned, we take the individual scores of students, we add them up and average them, and that becomes the school's indicator score. Okay, so this is the only one where, if, if you look, the raw performance on this is actually equal to the indicator score. Everything else, the raw and the indicator are different. This one, they're always the same. We talked about these things, one extra year to the timeline, using 2020 as a prior, effectively excludes students newly identified. We are though uh, including any students who attained proficiency, i.e. a performance level of 4.8 in their grade, uh, in 2021, right? So if, we, if we're skipping the 2021 data, you, you might not otherwise get credit for those kids. We're gonna make sure you get credit for it. All right, so let's talk about some student examples. Um, Millie is currently a, well, Let's say it this way. In 2022, Millie was a fifth grader who was first identified in kindergarten. And so that red chart at the bottom right down there, that's her history. That's her sort of access score history. So if you see in kindergarten, she starts with a score of 130, and then in uh, first grade, she jumps up to a 269. That is her score history. Above are the targets. Millie's target used to be grade six, right? Because she was identified as a first grader. And so we would have expected her to be proficient by grade six, but now she gets an extra year. So it's now seven and 400. So you kind of see how the, that math is working there? Okay. So again, um, we, we then calculate a new timeline target for her. Originally, it was 393 minus 269 divided by five gets you 24.8. Now it becomes 400 minus 269. Again, she's still starting from the same spot. 
divided by six, number of years, 21.83. And so as we would have calculated her revised targets, this is how that math would have played out over the years for Millie. Initially, uh, her revised target would have been uh, a 21.83 because she went uh, from 269 to 281. But then it kind of jumps up to a 28. In school year 2021, she would have been at 25.67. And now notice that the, the, the math changes again. That's why I put it in red. She's now got a new target at, in 22 of 400. She's still starting from that same spot because we're still using the 2020 score as the prior. And she's still got three years left to grow because this is the year that we give her that extra year. So, so I know it's a little complicated following it, but here she's rolling along. We're in 19, we're in 20, we're in 21, and all of a sudden the math changes in 22. But point being, for her, her timeline target's still the smaller of the two of them, right? So we're going to give her credit for her gain divided by her timeline target, which unfortunately only gets her about 22 points. She's, she's, she's been struggling. She had a rough year. It's okay, happens. Yuan is our eighth grader who was first identified in kindergarten. And um, unfortunately, no matter if we give him an extra year, he's still past his timeline. So. At this point, the goal is to get Yuan from wherever he is to proficient as quickly as possible. There are no more timeline targets. There are no more revised targets. There's just the distance from where he is to where he needs to be to be proficient. So really, there's no funny math for him. It's just literally, where does he need to be in grade eight? He needs to be at 406. Where was he in grade seven? Well, in this case, grade six, because we're giving him that distance, it was 50. So what did he actually make? And he actually got really close. I mean, he is super close to hitting 4.8, isn't he? So most, it, so his gain from 2020 to 2022 divided by his target, 50, gives him 90 points. So point being, students can still earn substantial points for progress even if they are past their timeline. Again, we never want to look at our kids and think just because they are past the timeline that they are not worth the effort. In fact, they are worth more. May is a 10th grader who was first identified in fourth grade. Um, and so again, she uh, is the example that um, is, is just kind of right on the cusp. Um, so again, originally she was supposed to be proficient by grade nine. Now it's grade 10. Timeline's not so applicable. Um, or, pardon me, it becomes applicable, right, because we've given her the extra year. So she was the one that's right on the cusp, and now, because she has the extra year, now we do factor in a timeline target for her. And so again, her revised target's 23, her timeline, because she gets the extra year, is 22. So her gain from 2020 of 395 to where she needs, you know, where she made it in grade 10, 405, divided by the smaller of the targets, gets her 45 points. And then again, Alembwe, my example for the high schools, right? This is someone who was first identified in ninth grade. So again, we're trying to get him proficient by grade 12. There is no higher grade, so there is no higher target. So even though he gets an extra year, his target and his grade don't really change. He's at a terminal grade. But the math changes. So his, his timeline target goes from a 22.8 to a 19. And again, you see his revised targets play out the same way. Um, and he is not yet to proficiency, obviously, but he is making more than sufficient progress. So he gets the full 100 points possible. Any questions with what I've shown so far? It's a lot of math. Yeah, go ahead. It, The longest that a student can be in the in the ESL program is till they exit, till they exit, till, till they, they get exit. that 480. Yep. Hmm? Till they get that 480. Uh, till they get to 4.8. Yes. 4 point, okay. Yep, that is correct. Great question. Anybody else? All right. 
Um, and then last but not least, Bernard. Uh, Bernard is our sixth grader who was currently identified in fifth grade, so literally just newly identified. Uh, he doesn't have much in the way of a history, and in fact, he doesn't have a 2020 prior score, so he will not be in the calculation, right? His math's easy. Again, uh, this is the slide that I showed earlier, uh, just with some slight tweaks to it. it. Just to illustrate the point that, in general, by giving every student an additional year to their timeline, it, it tends to give them both extra time and extra points. So this gives you, as their educators, a little bit of extra cushion, right? So, so we're not immediately expecting you to have solved the problem of the impact of the pandemic on EL students. We've got some time. So I'm going to jump now into accessing some of the data on these students because I think it's, it's just really important for you to kind of see how this data plays out. So we're going into the student information system. If you are not someone in your district who has access to the student information but you would like it, your superintendent is the person who can give it to you or his or her designee because let's be honest, not all of our superintendents are the most tech savvy people in the world, right? They bring other skills to the work, that's fine. They designate the tech stuff to someone else. Uh, reports and then summative designation, summative reports. Uh, there is a, another one underneath it. It says Summative Reports 2018. That's literally the reports that we published in 2018. They were in a slightly different format, so we, we don't have the resources to convert them to the new format, so they're just, they're just there. They're archived. Uh, the only reason you'd ever go there is to look at your 2018 data. And you guys get your very own indicator report. You are, in fact, the only indicator currently that has its own report. Um, because it's just that complicated. It, and it's not the math itself that's complicated. It's all just uh, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. But there's so much history that gets pulled into this, and there is nowhere else in the entire system that it's all brought together in the same way. So I really, like, if you were to pull the report, this is what it would look like. Um, it doesn't have the nice little labels, I put that there, so that we would know what we're talking about. But in the report itself, the columns are labeled with letters, A, B, C, D, E, and so on, out to O. O is the points that they earned in 2022. Column O, the one on the far right, is the points that they earned in 2022. It's very helpful because it gives you a sense of were they on track or not. Now, remember, because we use the smaller of, a kid can actually earn the full points and still not be on track, but they've still made decent enough progress, right? That's basically what that number says. Did they make decent enough progress? So if, if I were doing this, one of the things that I like to do is I like to sort on column O and just chunk my kids into some buckets. My, my kids who are 80 and above, hey, those kids are, if they're not actually on track, they're very close to being on track. One of the ways you can interpret that is that essentially whatever you're doing with these kids is working for them. Some might need a little bit more, some might need a slightly different variation, but at the end of the day, what you're doing is working with them. Then you've got the kids who are somewhere between 75 and 50, right? It's working, it's having an impact, but not as much as we want it to have, right? They're not making the progress we would hope for them. And so that's where you need to start diving into other sources of data to understand what's going on with them. This data is not gonna tell you what's going on. It's just gonna tell you where you start, you need to start asking questions. Then you can look at your students who are scoring 50 and below, but they're still above like 20 or so, so 50 to 25. Um, these are kids for whom your interventions are not working at the end of the day. Whatever, whatever we're doing with them, it's not having the impact we want. We need to rethink it. And obviously, if a student is, is earning points 25 or below, that, that suggests they might even be going backwards, and that's not what we want, right? So that's, that's a student in need of intervention uh, and fairly quickly. So that's, that's helpful. It's one way to sort of triage and, and, and tier your kids. The other way to do it is off the information in column N. So N's the one just to the left of O. And that's the actual points that they would need to travel 
in the current, right? So a lot of this is based off of 2022, but N is all about 2023. N is the scale score points they would need to gain in 2023 to be on track. That is their revised target for 2023. So it might be big, it might be small, right? Kids who grew very fast, they're gonna have small ones. Kids that are, are slowing down, they're gonna have bigger ones. And so again, you can sort your kids by how big their revised target is, right? That's another way to think about who needs intervention and who doesn't. If the targets are getting smaller, they don't need as, whatever you're doing for them is working. If their targets are getting bigger, it's not. So those two, I think from a practitioner standpoint are about the most helpful columns, they really are. The rest are kind of there just for you to be able to validate our math. Um, and so again, the amount of scale score gain that, that they made is given to you. It's in column C, and we just put the math right there for you. Column A is their most recent, column B is their prior, so A minus B equals C. No one said there would be algebra, right? <laughs> A minus B equals C. D is normally static. Right? We calculate it once, it stays the same for five years until they're past their timeline and then it goes away. But because we gave everybody the extra year, this year it is changing. So if you go and pull the 21 reports and then you pull the 22 reports and you look, that will not be the same number. Um, e, of course, changes yearly. That's their revised target so that you know. But remember, that was their revised target for 2022. So think about it this way. E was how far they would have needed to travel in 2022 to remain on track. 20, N is how far they need to go in 2023 to stay on track. So if N is bigger than E, that's a problem, right? Because it means that the target is getting bigger. It means they didn't cover the distance they needed to in 2022. So N has gotten bigger. So if N is bigger than E, that's not good. So that's another bit of math that you can do with this report to help you understand which kids are progressing, which kids are not. And by how much, because you're gonna have some kids that are, are way overshooting their targets, you're gonna have others that are just barely making it. Again, D and E will always be equal to each other in the first year because, well, that's the first year in their timeline, right? So. They don't have a rise target, it's the same thing. Um, partial years. I didn't actually talk about this, but I did mention that we only include students in the calculation who are with you for at least half a school year. But we also know that this is a somewhat um, mobile population, and they don't necessarily even move around the state of Illinois. They often um, leave the state and or leave the country and then return to us. And so what we do, right, again, for purposes of accountability, if, if a student is with you, let's say in first and second grade, and then they leave for third, that would be a partial year because they're not here. If they come back in fourth, we, we don't know what services, if any, they received in that missing year. So we don't want it to be a part of their accountability progress to proficiency timeline. So what that partial year does is it tells us which students have sort of been absent, right? So again, it might be an interesting number to sort on. What kinds of kids do you have? Do you have kids that have partial years that are in the threes, fours, fives? That's a kid that's highly mobile. That student might need very different supports than a student that's been with you and stayed with you. Um, but again, we talked about giving every student an additional year to their timeline. That's how we did it. We gave every student a partial year. That was built into the system. It makes the math really easy because if we just give every student a partial year, it takes care of columns J, K, L, and M, the grade in which we expect them to be proficient, the year in which we expect them to be proficient, the proficiency target in that grade. So all of that just sort of flows nicely if we give every student who was an EL in 2021 a partial year. So if you pull this report, you will now see that almost every student has one as a partial year. Anybody 
who has more than one has actual additional partial years, right? So used to be lots of zeros, a few ones. Now we're going to have lots of ones, a few twos, threes, fours. All right. So again, years to grow is column L, L as in Larry. All right, so when L is greater than zero, that is to say the student is still within their timeline, we are using the smaller of D or E. That's, that's what that little equation says. And N, therefore, is equal to their proficiency target minus their most recent scale score divided by their years left to grow. That's what that math says. I'll say it again in English instead of math speak. When their years left to grow, column L, is bigger than zero, then their score, their points earned, column O, is their gain, column C, divided by the smaller of D or E. And N, the distance that they need to travel in the next academic year, is calculated by taking M, their proficiency target, minus their most recent scale score, and dividing it by L, their years left to grow. Again, lots of algebra. <laughs> when the years left to grow is less than or equal to zero, then, again, we're just trying to get them to proficiency as quickly as possible. So their score is simply their gain divided by the distance from where they need to be to where they are, and their revised target is literally just their, their next year's target minus uh, the most recent scale score. So again, I've talked about some of this being past-looking data and some of it being forward-looking data. A, C, E, L, and O are all things that are past-looking. They're from the most recent academic year, 2022. N is looking forward. It's about 2023. Um, and then again, just another way of looking at how you figure out what targets are when a student has passed their timeline. And these will absolutely be posted. I've already emailed them to Josie, so I know she will get them posted. These are also all available on the isb.net forward slash summative site, so lots of places that you can download this. In fact, I'd love to point you to those very resources right now. Uh, the URL is www.isb.net forward slash summative. Uh, unfortunately, we're not linked off the main page, but if you just put the word summative or designation or anything else, uh, English Learner Progress to Proficiency, in the search box, we will pull up. We've redesigned the site. Um, the main thing is that there is that green individual indicators button. It's on the top left-hand side. Um, that's where all of the really relevant information is, but we are always looking ahead, trying to anticipate future needs. So uh, if you are interested on some of the things that we're, we're thinking about for future years, uh, that's where our Illinois Balanced Accountability Measures Committee uh, page comes in and our Technical Advisory Committee page comes in. We've also redesigned the main page so that uh, resources that are year independent, right, that, that are applicable no matter when, are right here on the main page. They're the first uh, banner. Anything, though, that is specific to uh, an individual year, for example, the thresholds for that year or the um, number of designations we issued, that's now been organized chronologically. This makes things a little bit easier to find. The individual indicators page, though, is where the important stuff lives. Uh, there's one for each of the indicators, English Learner Progress to Proficiency is the third bar down. I know that text is way too small to read, but it's the third one down. And if you click the little arrow to the right, uh, it will open that. And what you will find is common information. Again, whether the uh, indicator is federally required or state selected, and whether it is an academic or school quality student success indicator, its weight in both the elementary and high school bands, a definition, a description of how we score it, the specific scoring formula. We have a section called New for 22, so if there's anything new that you need to know, that's where you would find it. And then again, resource specific indicators. So uh, today's video will eventually go there as well because it seems like that would be a, a helpful indicator specific resource. And so with that, 
I'd love to take your questions. Um, I really don't care how specific to your individual circumstances they are. If it's on your mind, if you want to know, I want to be able to try and answer it for you. Although my answer may be, we should set a time to talk. All right, just come up to the, just come up to the mic. Uh, just a quick question. If you can go back to slide number 30. Mm -hmm. I can try. Let's see if I can count. Okay. That's slide 30. Actually, uh, 29 then. Okay. All right. 29. Okay. Yes. So this report is available very much in summary format. My wonder is if we could have access to the individual student report like this. This, this is the individual student report. There, there is no summary version of the ELP to peer report. This, I've cut off the names, but this is. I know, but um, let me okay. maybe provide further clarification. Okay. So if we take a look at grade number four, that's one student going right. across. If yeah. we take a look at grade number three, that's another student going right. across. My ask is similar to um, just as we work through and getting this information out mm -hmm. uh, to our classroom teachers and so forth, it, it's helpful mm -hmm. to have this information in a similar format that what we have in access under IWAS, under the individual student report, under assessments. Why? Because as we take a look, it's, it's a printout of the individual student's report mm -hmm. that then we can easily um, pass out. Well, and in addition to that, a way of perhaps having those, that individual report format, but available so that you can just run a report and run the individual print, because it's more user-friendly, particularly for the type of usage mm -hmm. that is really going to be beneficial. So that was just a thought as I, I uh, go I, through that data. I will put it in the queue for development for next year. That's a great suggestion. Thank you. I, I, I sadly cannot get it this year, but I, I love suggestions like that. What else? What can we do for you? Um, the question that I had was just, is this information for the current EL still identified, or is this still pulled from just access students of ELs identified last year? So this is, um, so a student that was newly identified this year would of course not be in this calculation because th this would literally be their baseline year, mm -hmm. right? If they were newly identified last year, they also wouldn't be in the calculation because they, they don't have a prior score. So really, the students who are in the calculation for this 2022 year, the 2022 designation, are kids who were identified as ELs back in 2020. So if they have reached proficiency in the intervening time, they would be included in the calculation. Okay. But, but only because we're doing something weird. Sure. And then how would that be designated there as far as, far as like their target? Since they would have already met their target, what, how would that be indicated? Um, that we're probably not going to be able to show because it's such a one-off for this year only. In a normal year, you would see it because their revised target for next year would be a negative number. And so when you see a, a negative number in that revised target for next year, you know they've reached proficiency. Okay, so that will, unfortunately, if it would show something, but just it, we wouldn't be able to show, obviously, right here. Yeah, n not, a, n not because, again, going to look for those kids that reached proficiency in years where the, we're not actually using the data from those years, it, it's really hard to merge it in, so. Sure. Um, the reason why I asked, because I loved how, obviously, you have, like, the projected year, so if students were able to meet it prior to the projected year, that would be a celebration uh, to yeah. show and oh, indicate uh, and, how they and were and two they would years before yeah, the you, target. You would see them in the, the yearly, uh, so any student that reached proficiency in 2022, you would know them in, in the 22 report because their revised target for next year would be a negative number. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. No, that's great. Yes. Do you all have access to this report in this form? Um, it's really anyone that the superintendent delegates access to. Uh, it's typically given at the district level, although some superintendents do then allocate access down at the building level. So principals typically only have access to the data for their buildings. Um, 
But if you are a district level staff, that would be the access level that you would be granted um, access at. So you would have access to all of the schools. I mean, that's really on, on your superintendent to decide. And uh, just to repeat that question for the um, microphone, it was at what level of access uh, is, is access to, who gets access to these reports and who decides that? Yeah. Hi, um, if a student cannot meet the five-year target, mm -hmm. let's say, for example, a 10th grader, yep. um, they will be in the report, but will they be also in the um, calculation for designation? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, there were a bunch of example kids that were past their timeline. They, they can still earn plenty of points as long as they are still making progress, yeah. The timeline is obviously there to create an incentive. We want to get kids out, and so it is easier for kids to get points during the timeline, but there's no reason that a student shouldn't be earning you points. It, as long as they're still in EL and they're with you and they're, you know, then they're in the calculation. So I'll do a corollary to that that I've been asked before but that is not being asked here. If a student is identified as an EL but their parent has refused service, are they in the calculation? Sadly, yes, they are. Yeah, you guys know that. Yes, that is correct. IEP students would also be in this calculation. Although your students who are taking alt access are not because it is on a different scale. And so we cannot include their data. It's, it's just not possible. Um, that is not, however, a reason to all of a sudden put all your kids on alt access. <laughs> we are tracking the percentages of kids who take alt access. Sorry, former assessment director just had to say that. <laughs> Question, uh, what about for a student that came here in like March of 2020? Does that still so, count? So, uh, they would not have been, they, they would not have been considered a part of the calculation in 2020. They would have been screened, but they wouldn't have taken access. So they would still, essentially the next year would have been their first year because that's the first year in which they have an access Even score. though they were like half remote, half school like that still counts 2021 for them yeah yeah but they still get the extra year to their timeline because they were they were in el in in mm -hmm. 21 yeah so i mean that's that's the whole point of giving kids who were els an additional year and of course because they were essentially first identified in 21 that's the first year in which they have an access score they won't have a 2020 prior so they won't be in this calculation this year's calculation they'll be in next year's This, this is considered a 2022 report because it is the data that informed the 2022 calculation. Yeah, so we're, we're always essentially referring to the, the year's worth of data that informed the calculation. So we test in, in winter and spring of 2022, we publish the report card and the designations in fall of 2022. So this is all the 2022 designation except for column N which is specific to 2023 because it's looking forward. So in running the report, I'm asking. Yes, you would run 2022. Under 2022. Yes, and okay. reports are unfortunately not going to be available until October 3rd. October 3rd. October 3rd, yes. Uh, and you have no idea how painful it is for me to say that. Um, I have, a, yeah, just come on up to the mic when you're, <laughs> yeah. You go Yes, that's correct, in Educator Preview, in my IRC, yep. I'm gonna use the mic this time. Cool. Um, so let's say a friend of mine, me, wants to get out ahead and now they have a better understanding of how to calculate. What tips would you give my friend, me, on what we should look for when we run the most current report that's there since we don't have the revised targets yet for this year yeah. to start planning some of those interventions? So funny that you should say that because uh, somebody who was your friend who was me back a month or so ago realized that we actually do have the, the most current access scores, right? I can't publish this report, but those scores are there. So I have a whole set of instructions on how to download the two reports, take the most current scores, merge them into this report, and do some back of napkin math 
for people who want to get out ahead. Now, it's like 50 steps long, and it involves VLOOKUPs, but as long as you can follow instructions, you should be okay, and give me a call if, if anything seems weird or wonky. But if, we're like, if, if we have a way to use, if we have composites, mm -hmm. composite scale scores yep. that we can merge, yep. we can do that quick math and run that math and then check what that was yep. to see. Yep full points or what that ratio may be. Yeah, because you can use the 2021 report to figure out what the, because the, you'll, just, you'll just add a year basically to their, and that's what it would right. be. And okay. so, so it's, I mean, it's not, it's not super hard. Thank you. No problem. No, that's a great question. All right, I'm looking at my time. It's 3.32, I'm happy to take any more questions, but if not, I'm happy to give you guys a few minutes back of your time. Thank you. Oh, yeah, come on. We have some students that did not take the access test last year because the parents were not there. So how, how are their schools Question. She said she had a bunch of students. At, well, she might have said much. She said some. She had some students who didn't test in 2021. How is that going to impact uh, calculations? Remember, we're skipping the 2021 data entirely. We're going back to 2020 for a prior. When we do this calculation in 2023, we'll go back to our normal method, which is current year, prior year, which would then be 2023 and 2022. So we're skipping the scores from 21 entirely, except for kids who reached proficiency in that year. Yep, great question. All right, thank you guys so much. Really appreciate you coming.